Good evening. Welcome to welcome to Grill the Committee. This is our opportunity to uh, fire our questions at a representative sample of, of the Standards Committee. And I don't mean this in the, in the sense that any of them are truly empowered to speak for the committee. I think they're uh, speaking for themselves here. But, but this is an opportunity for us to learn how the committee thinks about things by looking at, at, at some of the people who are influential and have been on the committee uh, a significant amount of time. And what? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you guys, I, I want you to introduce yourself, but I want you to talk about both what your formal role in the committee is and also what you feel like you're, you personally are trying to accomplish on the committee. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm Titus Winters. I'm the chair for the Library Evolution Working Group, which is the, uh, it's the subcommittee room that is responsible for API design for the standard library. Um, so what were the questions exactly? What is my, that's my formal role. Yeah, yeah. And so the other thing is, you know, what is it you're, you personally are trying to accomplish on the committee? Uh, so the, my two biggest goals uh, for the committee are to minimize the number of missteps that we make in library design. It's really, really expensive and frustrating and annoying when my very large code base has to do something different than what the standard does. And we will if we have to, but it's not pleasant and I don't like to do it, so I would much rather like get it early. Um, so I sit in library evolution constantly, uh, even before I was the chair, uh, to try to like catch API design problems. Um, and then the second thing that I do for uh, at the committee level is try to get the committee to grant itself the right to fix mistakes. <laughs> which is a deeply fraught process. <laughs> um, many of the things that I worry about are whether the committee is prioritizing every piece of code that has ever been written or every piece of code that ever will be written. And that is not a small question. And one of the things that makes me very happy about there actually being a grill of the committee uh, is, hey, this is literally the biggest sample of the C++ community that we're going to get. So tell us how you feel, yo. <laughs> I'm Herb Sutter. I'm currently the chair of the committee. And the SUS administrative role, I convene meetings, and, so, and including extra ones, like we just actually, this is day five for some people who have been in committee meetings, like I think most of the people on this stage, for the last four days. Yes, that includes the weekend, those are calendar days. Um, and because we were all here, so let's, let's work some more on modules and executors. So thank you to all those who did that. Um, personally, apart from my administrative role, where I, I, I run the committee, but I do not speak for it, personally, I have goals, and I still don't speak for the committee, but my personal goals involve evolving C++ in a way that will simplify C++ code. And yes, that means adding things to the language that makes the language bigger, but code simpler. Um, and that overlaps a lot with the kind of goals that Titus had, including how can we eventually fix more of our mistakes? So that's something I'm working on as a multi-year project. Hi, um, I'm Olivier Giroux, um, or you can also call me Oliver. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm the chair of the uh, study group for concurrency and parallelism. It's a fairly big group. I think only the evolution working group ends up um, meeting in larger rooms. Uh, my personal goal for the group, you know, I only had like this much time to think about it. Um, <laughs> now, uh, actually, I have a, I have. Two. So there's a lot of activity in concurrency and parallelism. It's definitely where all of the exciting new platforms are from all of the big businesses. So there's a lot of pressure coming into SG1 from various corporations to extend the reach of C++ beyond where it's been before. So I have I have two goals for personally. Uh, I I want the SG-1 room to work a bit like a team, 
We are formally not a team on the committee. We're a large herd of cats. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, SG-1 used to, people used to claw at each other a little bit more, and that has changed. We now work more together, and I want to reinforce that. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, I sort of have a bar where I want conscientious designs. Um, it's really easy to make parallel and concurrent constructs that are just a way to lose more fingers. And um, I want, I, I really want to encourage the uh, conscientious design approach where you can use things correctly probably the first time. Oh, you have an independent mic. Cheers. Anyway, <laughs> um, so Janus Drogstrup. Um, my only formal role in the committee is to be on the uh, direction uh, group. And I am this year's chair of that group because of a random number generator which um, may or may not have played fair. <laughs> How, Howard wrote it and I didn't verify it. But anyway, in, um, in, in, in that group, we try to set a direction for uh, C++. In particular, it's not the directions group. We're, we're trying actually to have a direction, and we are considering what that direction is, what the rate of change can be, um, where the emphasis on desirable um, improvements uh, should be. Uh, my personal aim is to get uh, C++ more coherent, have a, a more solid foundation for everything. Uh, if you are at the keynote, you'll see me uh, in the domain of generic, generic programming, but that's not by any means the only place where we can do with a better foundation. And um, basically um, trying to popularize a couple of slogans like keep simple things simple and uh, remember the VASA. Uh, my name is Marshall Clow. I'm the chairman of the library working group. Um, we're responsible for the wording for the back two thirds of the standard, so say from page 500 to 1500. Um, <laughs> the library working group is, a, is one of the smaller working groups. Um, it tends to be dominated by a, a a group of intensely conservative people. These are the people who have standard library implementations. Um, but so we try to balance that this like, oh, you're going to break my implementation with, oh, we need to keep moving forward. Um, I am one of the people with implementations, by the way. Um, anyway, my so my personal goal is to keep things moving forward and to keep and with without pissing off the implementers too bad, because I don't want to piss off myself. Um, and you know, as a side benefit, you know, if I can break Titus's code base on a regular basis, that's all good. <laughs> Come at me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, we try really hard not to break code, other people's code, um, and we go to a lot of effort in people's implementations not to break code. And in in the stand, in the LWG group, with as Titus has said, you know, it's like. <gasps> oh, we can't do that because it's going to break existing code that does this. And sometimes the answer is, oh, well, that's just dumb. That's <laughs> dumb code. We should break that code. And we don't always, we don't always agree on that. But anyway, so um, I agree with Titus in general that we need to figure out when it is OK to break people's code. And the, answer is, the answer right now is almost never. And I think we should move it up to very, very rarely. But still. Um, that's all I got to say. My name is Howard Hennett. I have a couple of roles on the committee. Uh, one of them is to represent my employer, Ripple, who, uh, who sends me to these meetings, and I'm uh, very grateful for that. <clears throat> I'm also a member of the directions group, and I'm in charge of randomly choosing the uh, chairman, which will <laughs> never be me. Uh, <laughs> random chance, of course. <laughs> Uh, see, I've been on the committee for a couple of decades, and I've got my fingerprints on various things like Move Semantics and Chrono and uh, calendars. calendars coming up in C++20. Uh, there'll be a lightning talk on that tomorrow night. Uh, come see that. Marketing. I, I'll, I will time it using the library. 
Um, and uh, see, I guess that's that's about all that keeps me busy. Hey, go there. All right. Uh, my name is Ville Voutelainen. I chair evolution so that Bjana no longer needs to. So I heard the evolutionary cats, and occasionally I help her to her the uh, cats in general. Uh, as I call it, I tend to the kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as my personal goals go, we have a bunch of uh, major features in the pipeline. Concepts, contracts, and well, likely modules as well. So what I'm trying to do is surreptitiously guide the group uh, to no small extent via my papers to actually finish concepts and contracts. And then as far as modules go, I uh, heavy-handedly tell the proposal authors to finish that particular job. Thank you. Um, I just, I just wanted, I don't know if you guys know this. Do you know what professional cat herders say after a bad day? Ouch. <laughs> they say, it, it could have been worse. It could have been speakers. <laughs> All right, um, if, so if you have any questions, that's what the session's for. So come on up to the mic. <laughs> It's not, is it on? Is it on? It's on? Okay. Uh, so, hello. Um, so, actually, I do have a question, and it's semi related to modules. Um, why can we not make a translation unit a file? To get to the other side? No. <laughs> <laughs> So we could, but why would that be the best choice that we can make as opposed to having some sort of freedom about your code layout? You can still have freedom of code layout if you have directories and files. It doesn't say that they have to be in a specific location. But it does let you say, well, now we know how to find a module. Interface or implementation. The committee's welcoming proposals. <laughs> I can write something I, in a week. I, I, I think part of the answer is what should be in that file, because of course they are files. It's just not C++ source code files. Uh, and the reason for that is that it takes forever to uh, pass the source code into something that can be used as a module. I'm just waiting to see if anyone else has anything else to say. Like I'm. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have one more question, so I'm gonna just give it back to you. Okay. So I love unique pointer. I like variant, but I get tired on writing things like std variant, uh, std unique pointer a, std unique pointer b. Some languages with less history manage to get this right earlier. Obviously, C has more history, but can we get uh, some direction on getting those things to be nicer to write? That is definitely it is bananas hard, uh, but uh, if I had absolute power <laughs> uh, to deploy tooling that I know absolutely could exist, uh, it would take 10 years or so for the standard to reclaim the global namespace. And then we could move all of those things back. Uh, I don't know that that is actually worth it, because that is an extremely expensive, very breaking change. But then you actually would have the nice property of everything that is standard, including int, lives in the global namespace. All of the things that are most common have the shortest names, which is what you want in a language. I'm not even afraid of the of stood in front, 
And I, I absolutely agree that it's so much easier to put things to a library than to syntax, because to change syntax, that's a big thing. Still, uh, new was so nice, you know? You could just write new. Oh, well, but this is the language that gets the defaults wrong by default, which is the wrong default. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know! I mean... Like, yeah, it's a matter of legacy, and, uh, you know, on the upside, we'll give you better performance than anyone else. <laughs> Just to understand your question, I think you partly answered it. Are you asking for things, it's not the STD you care about, you'd like things like, well, what if new returned unique pointer, is that what you're asking? Oh, that would be great if you could do that, <laughs> please, I mean. I have no answer. I'm just trying to understand the yeah, question I mean, and what you would like it to be. Uh, well, sure. just, I'm just curious if you're alone. Okay. How many here, if you could rewrite history, would love to be in a in a alternate reality of C++ where new just returned unique pointer by default? Cool. I, I did not know if one head would go up or lots, and I'm surprised at how many. <laughs> Thank you. We have alternate spelling of new that does that. It's longer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I was, yeah. Sorry, uh, for those who didn't hear it, I said we have an alternate spelling of new that does that. It's spelled M-A-K-E underscore U-N-I-Q-U-E, but it's much longer. But I'm guessing that every single one of you has a, an editor that has macros, and you can oh. type M-U. <laughs> Show we got 18 minutes into this before somebody said the M word. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going to be a record show. Marshall got voted off the stage. <laughs> uh, but will I get star to mean unique pointer as well? No. <laughs> no, sorry. I mean, we, we, we have to remember that we've got a few billion lines of code out there and we have no control over it. We have a few million programmers out there, we can't retrain them. Um, it's, it's a big problem and it, sometimes I think I'm even more uh, conservative than say Titus. Uh, I just want uh, people to use uh, modules and, and um, concepts and things like that consistently, but you have to talk people into doing it. Uh, making things simple and simpler is hard. Um, I, I like the fact that we now no, no longer have to say uh, vector of int, we can deduce the int. Uh, we no, no longer has to say sort of something dot begin, comma, something dot end. We can say something, um, thanks to, to, to the ranges proposal and such. We can simplify, but there's a sort of probably a maximum rate of change that we can sustain and people always want new things, they always want simpler things, and above all, don't break my code. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Sometimes people are afraid, actually, to combine them. But... So uh, one thing that I end up doing at every company I work at is, you know, re-implement reflection. So one of the things I was gonna ask the committee is, I know there's pr proposals out there for reflection, but I just wanted to know what the status on getting reflection into C++ was. So we have a technical specification. Um, we expect to go in a direction that's different from that technical specification. <laughs> Hold on. So we expect that uh, the implementation of that TS will provide us the underlying plumbing that will be useful for the uh, actual kind of reflection that we want to do. So once I'm done with concepts, uh, modules, and contracts, and we actually ship C++ 20, uh, reflection is going to be a suggested major feature goal for C++ 23. 
Whether we'll get there within the uh, 23 time frame remains to be seen, but I am going to twist a couple of thumbs so that we make the best effort that we can. Well, at the end of the year, if you guys need help on reflection, I'd be willing to help by the end of the year. So mm -hmm. I'm, I guess I'll contact you and see if I can help you out with that. Um, I have a, a slightly off-topic comment. I see a lot of people standing in the aisles and oh. in the back. I see a lot of empty seats here, here, there, there. Come on, and sit, come on in and sit down. Don't look like you're going to bolt the first time I say something wrong. And thank you guys very much. Uh, they would already be gone, Marshall, if... Uh... <laughs> Welcome back, Izzy. Hello again. Um, so I was going to ask about the restrict qualifier, but I've decided to change my mind last minute here. Um, so Arthur or Dwyer, I don't know if Arthur's here. There he is, actually. So Arthur is writing this trivially relocatable uh, paper. Cool. <laughs> the paper fits on your badge? <laughs> That's... Oh. Um, so the question I have is, how hard would it be for us to, in addition to having non-destructive moves, as we currently do with the way things are, to make relocation our destructive move effectively, um, to, to, you know, basically have what Bust has, where they just do a move, and then they don't have to worry about anything, because the old value got, as I think the phrase you used is, uh, the compiler drops it on the floor, and um, I, would, I would really appreciate that, because it's nice. <laughs> so I think destructive move would be a uh, distinct uh, advantage to have a good feature. I don't think it would replace our uh, non-destructive move at all. But I, oh, think, I wasn't saying it replaces it. I yeah, said it but I think it would complement it very nicely, because yeah. there's several places where it would be very useful. For example, with the... Uh, Vector buffer reallocation is yep. a prime example of where destructive move is just a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. So anytime you've got something that's on the heap that you need to move from one place to the other, uh, where the compiler isn't going to automatically call a destructor on you, um, I think that, that'd be great. And, and maybe Arthur can, can add to that. Uh, the only thing I would add here is that- Can you speak up to the mic, please? Yeah, get up to the mic. I do have a paper, it will be in the San oh. Diego I, I do have a paper, it will be in the San Diego mailing. I won't be at San Diego, someone will be shepherding it, and I forget if I have someone or not, but, um, but I just want to point out the paper's not published yet. So, I do, so someone on stage is gonna say, the paper's not even published yet, and that is completely true. <laughs> Actually, I was going to say, there's a paper that's making its way through, there's active interest in the feature, but it's really early to talk about it. Okay. Um, so for all the, the things that were mentioned, those are all great use cases. You can imagine other cases where somebody might want to move an object's address and memory, which in general you can't do to a C++ object without potentially um, confusing it and the system. But if you know a type's relocatable, you could say you have a compacting memory arena. There's lots of things that it enables. Yes. Um, so there's definite interest there, but it's early days for the proposal. It's okay. going to take some time to mature. Okay. And uh, Arthur, I'm going to... So, so yes, we to, uh, do have interest in having this facility. We have tried having it before, and the earlier proposals didn't quite solve the concerns of what it, how it would interact with certain expectations of object lifetime. So it's a non-trivial problem. I would be more than happy to see a proposal that actually works so that we don't run into those problems. Yeah, I was just going to comment that um, for most proposals, 90% of the work is in integration with the rest of the language and the library and such. And quite often, uh, people has a great idea, even if it's great, underestimate that amount of work um, enormously. And quite often, it's a proposal that ends up doing most of it. And the other thing is that the last thing we need just now is uh, bright new ideas before we uh, manage to do the feature freeze for 20. So a little bit later. You're really not going to like San Diego then. <laughs> <laughs> and I just 
like to say I know there is at least one person uh, at CPPCon who has written almost exactly this paper before. I suspect there's a person on the stage who has written exactly this paper before. It's not a new idea. It's, it's, uh, and it's not an idea that hasn't died with it. Okay. I think I'm done, actually. Tell me if I'm done. Thank you. Hello. Um, let me just say first, this is quite intimidating. <laughs> um, so I've never heard of destructive move, but I feel like this question is actually a little bit related. Um, in my company, I've noticed that people just don't use move very often because you have to like, use it. You have to say, I want to move. Um, so you can move without realizing that you can't, and you cannot move without realizing that you can. And I'm wondering if there's any plan to enable I don't know, a smarter compiler that would move when you don't explicitly say to move. I mean, I know it breaks a lot of the semantics of like destructors like when they run and everything, um, but I feel like for most types it doesn't matter. Um, so one half of that, uh, you said you can uh, move when you can't, and I assume that you mean you call to move and it doesn't matter? Yeah, you, well, um, the, the two scenarios are you use after move and you don't use after you copy, which, you know, one, one has to be a copy, uh, one has to be a move. Yeah. Okay. Um, now that stopped being a library question at all, and that became a language <laughs> question, so I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add that some of the lifetime-related work, which I talked about a few years ago, see if you can that I'll be talking about it more on Thursday, Part of it applies to detecting use after move, but it's not the only thing. There's actually several static analyzers who are actively doing work this year and starting to ship in uh, experimental form to detect use after move. To me, the most interesting thing that I've encountered as uh, the folks I'm working with have been testing those against some early real world code. And again, I stress all of this is early. None of this happens in a month or a year. But one of the, you, you learn things when you first start using it in a real world code. Uh, but I meant to tell you this, Bjorn, and I'll tell you now. Uh, so it turns out that first, yes, in fact, you do detect some great use after move bugs, and you can make great slides and show that, hey, look, you use this after move, you know, you shouldn't use this object again until, unless you call it on a function with no preconditions, blah, blah, blah. The other thing you find, which I should have realized but didn't, because I'm dumb and didn't have the foresight to see it, is you start flagging places where people wrote move unnecessarily, which you'll love. It appears in the LLVM code base. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that, but my first recommendation is don't use dirt move. Second uh, recommendation, in emergencies, you might very rarely use dirt move. Okay. It moves implicitly very nicely, and it's very rare. You really, really need it. So we do have some active work on uh, removing some restrictions on whether you need to use move on a return. As far as needing to use move when passing something into a function, yeah, I do know how Rust works. It's non-obvious to me that that way is superior. I would need to have evidence that the uh, breakage of existing assumptions on the validity of the uh, local variable are really worth changing those semantics of the language. I see. Yeah, and if you go back to my talk from today, at a library level, one of the things that I very specifically said was uh, copy and move or an overload set. Uh, if a type doesn't move effectively, that's the author's bug. If you don't move when it is relevant and might be useful, that is your bug, right? Yes. And I don't believe that you should specifically be limiting yourself to only calling std move when there actually is a move constructor for a type because you might know that the type is currently expensive and that the author just hasn't gotten around to writing a move constructor for it. Like, if it's a heavyweight type, you should probably still move it to be future compatible with that oncoming optimization. Like, that's, yeah. that's my logic. I, f 
figured you might say something about like the overload set because um, yeah, you, you, you can make two overloads, one takes a const ref, one takes like a ref ref, um, but I find at least the code that me and my coworkers write, we don't wanna do that, we just make the value one that you can optionally move into, and I just want that to automatically move when you can. If you don't use it again, then you can move it, and the code reviewer might say, oh, you should use std move here. So I want the compiler to be the code reviewer, and it to say, you can use std move here. But the compiler can only do that if it can tell that your destructor for that type does not ever matter, right? Yeah. And right. because this is a language where destructors are so heavily used and so deeply important, uh, that's asking for a non-trivial amount of magic. Yes, and I want the magic, please. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let, let, uh, come, come back to the committee with a solution to the holding problem. Okay. Oh. Uh, we'll do. There, there, there might be simpler solutions for simple cases, but a lot of the interesting ones, you really end up with the impossibility there. We're, we're starting to get a bit of a line here, so I'm going to every once in a while nudge us to move on. All right. Thank you very much. Herb, your static analysis thing doesn't solve this problem, does it? You can detect use after move, but you can't detect, like, no use after move? Is, is that possible? There's, there's flip sides to it. First of all, it doesn't detect every use after move at all. Um, and there's several, because the, the, you, you can't no. find them all. Um, when, you do, when you do that, you detect use after move, and you detect wrote, stood, move, and shouldn't. Your false but you're right, false what, what, yeah. what I believe the previous questioner was asking for is, uh, on every simple control flow path through the function, if the last use of a value is not a move, implicitly make it a move, something like that, I'd love to see a paper. Um, it's been suggested, I saw committee uh, email reflector messages on that just this summer, yeah. but it takes a paper. Bill, I mentioned a couple of papers coming to EWG on uh, return statements in particular. Uh, come to my talk tomorrow for that. But my question was much more trivial. I almost asked the Bjorn after his talk, and I was like, Herb, stick around, this is for you too. And the question is, giraffe case. Uh, in uh, Bjorn's presentation and in your paper on concept syntax, you have like capital V value underscore lowercase type and, and you know, capital F forward lowercase iterator. I hate What's that and I do it because that? I'm a nice guy. Where did that come from, and why do you keep doing it? Who's, who started that? Is that person on the stage? Uh, I, I, I still strongly prefer underscores, and I hate uh, those capital letters in the middle of words. And um, somewhere in the depth of time, um, we started. You, somebody started to use that notation for concepts, and it has just stuck. If somebody wants to rename them, they can make a proposal. I would probably. Uh, support it if I thought there was little enough uh, use. If you look at my old papers, like uh, from last year, I tend to use the underscores. Um, there was an idea that it would be nicer if concepts were named different from uh, other identifiers. It's a bright idea people get for every new thing. They have to stand out and be loud. I believed that too five years ago, and I was wrong. <laughs> um, it's ha having things stand out just because they are new means that, well, soon, soon it will not be new anymore. The question is whether this mistake can be changed at this stage. Uh, if you write a paper, it will be considered. Uh, let me just say that the reason I just went along with it, even though I found it not very palatable, is because it doesn't really matter. It's great to get agitated about a barrel water cooler, and life's too short for that. <laughs> it, it works, it compiles, I want to solve more problems. That's not a problem I'm interested in spending cycles on. And as the resident, we haven't actually committed to supporting any of that. Uh, all of the usage of concept is not in any published standard. We can change all of the names right now. And I will argue deeply against anyone that says, oh, there's users of that. Like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are using it out of experimental. You don't count. I, I'm, I'm a user, officially. 
and I care. Not of a dress. Not of a standards. Oh. <laughs> also fine. All right. Thank. I, thank you. Oh. I will merely point out that the, the all the concepts in the ranges proposal are all camel case, no underscores. <laughs> um, I, I I offer no opinion. Just point it out. It's a uh, you know first it, first letter cap camel case. You know. Pascal case. Yeah. <laughs> All the camels I've seen are, are high at the front. <laughs> How many hills can you die on? <laughs> Did you have a question, Gasper? <laughs> Gasper, save us from this. True. Okay, Gasper, you're up. Right. Um, so, um, as a person who is seeing a feature freeze for a standard for the first time, because I haven't been a, an author for too long, uh, could you please explain what that means? About a year before we ship, we feature freeze, we send out what's called a committee draft where you want the features frozen because that's your ballot comment where you're going to get mo your, your ballot for comments where the national body, some of whom haven't looked at your work until you say you're ready for them to review it, are going to look at it. And so you want all the features to be there. It's uh, considered impolite to add a feature after that if before the, in the final ballot. They'll, somebody may stand up on their hind legs and say, hey, what? Um, so we have a feature freeze and it also gives us about a year to do bug fixes and, and the, the long tail of issues that got deferred that we want to ship. So that we currently want to aim for uh, the first or second meeting next year, uh, second meeting next year to feature freeze for C++20. That means that there's a land rush right now to get major proposals in because you do not want to wait, to, the committee will not let you wait till the last meeting to do that. So all the big rocks are now, people are angsting to get in. Uh, for San Diego and possibly Kona. So we're in that phase of the cycle where there's lots of work right now. And usually it also means that more people are attending committee meetings. We're at about double what we were five years ago. So we've been regularly getting 140 people at each meeting for the last couple of meetings. That's typical. The bump that's higher than before. The number is higher, but the bump itself, the shape is typical for this phase in the standard cycle. So the uh, feature freeze is also solving a sort of mechanical, technical problem that we uh, realized when we were standardizing C++14. At the very last meeting, we had an insane rush of late proposals that were hardly essential. So uh, it was a big problem for the core wording, uh, working group and well, since I still happen to have a membership card for that group, and the chair is a very good friend of mine, I told him that I will make some effort to fix this problem so that you can actually focus on uh, finalizing the standard as opposed to having a constant influx of completely new material at the very end. So we actually uh, had a unofficial feature freeze for 17. Now we actually have a plan that contains that feature freeze and we have voted on it. So we are expecting to stick to it. We've got, um, we've got a lot of questions. Can you be brief? <laughs> we've got a lot of questions. I want to get, yeah. um, there's a pipeline going through the committee from study groups to uh, working groups to the groups that does the final uh, text, like the library group and the uh, core working group. So if you put something into the pipeline, it comes out several months later. And apart from that, there are things we don't discover, so we integrate it into the final text. We need a feature freeze to be able to deliver, deliver a quality product that's not that different from any other major product. I mean, I completely agree that a, fr a freeze is a great idea. I was just wondering what procedurally it means. Does it like r roughly mean don't make new chapters, but it's fine to fix wording, or what exactly? Oh, the, yeah. the, the wording gets changed up until the until the committee draft goes out, and then in response to NB comments. But um, but yeah, new features. There's there's a deadline for um, the deadline coming up very soon. For, for actually voting new features into C++ 20. So we have actually specified what it means. 
San Diego is the last meeting where we look at papers that we haven't seen before. That's what it is. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for all your hard work, because I'm sure it's a tremendous amount that we see the very tip of. Um, but as far as I'm aware, after C++11, you guys kind of radically changed how the standardization works. Mm -hmm. Study groups, TSs, working groups. So two parts, do you think that change has been working very well? I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have an opinion. It seems like it's working to me. But what do you guys think? And if you could change one thing about the way that either the committee works or just standardization in general, you know, if you could wish something into existence, what would it be? I, I, since I have a microphone, I can give you a short answer. And that is, uh, before C++11, we had one release in eight years. Since C++11, We've had three releases in six years, if you count 11, 14, and 17, and we're going to have another one in three more. Um, and from that point of view, the, the rate of change has sped up a lot. But that's, that's just one point of view. I'm sure everybody else on this, on this stage has, has more to say, so I will have that. So one of the things that we have, I mean, we've tried the TS process since 11. Uh, we've, we haven't been quite so uniform about what that means and what the bar should be for getting anything into a TS. Um, you know, Titus clarified recently something that was great, which is, you know, a TS should answer a question, so you should write up front. It was you? Uh, Not me. Oh, all right. Someone, someone came up with this rule and it's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. There. Um, okay. So, um... <laughs> All right, um, right. So, uh, so we haven't been so good about figuring out what's the bar for getting things into a TS, and uh, and then managing the expectation that things that go into TSs then just roll into the IS right away. You know, so um, so I think every TS has ended up having sort of a, a unique cultural environment around it, um, and so we're still trying to figure this out. Um, the three-year model is also great, um, but um, you know, and the committee is not a is not a corporation, obviously. Um, if it were a corporation, though, it would be a little bit more zen about not fretting about uh, loading everything at the last minute because a train is shipping, and oh my God, there's not going to be any more trains. Um, there is going to be another train, and it's just whenever things are ready, things go in. And if a thing is not ready today, just don't cry over spilled milk. It's going to be ready next time. Like, of course, it's going to be ready next time. Like, if you think it was. Close to ready this time? For sure it's ready next time. So don't fret too much about that. But actually, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A actually, every three years, we have like a massive argument about everything must go in right now. Um, that could be improved. So uh, there's disagreement on this stage whether uh, the uh, concepts and modules, TSs, were successful. However, it's um, unambiguously observable that they allowed us to fix certain problems that we couldn't anticipate and uh, had we actually adopted those features sooner we might have ended up in a much more problematic situation than where we are today. So yeah, it was painful. We would have liked to ship concepts a lot sooner, but some of those fixes were actually really, really good. And the uh, ability to ship a specification, uh, gain implementation experience on it was overall positive, in my opinion. Bjarne might disagree. Um, I, I have some opinions, yes. <laughs> uh, one of my, the opinions is that moving something into the uh, standard uh, creates much uh, activity and many improvements. Um, voting things in actually can make, make things improve faster instead of endless uh, discussions about whether you move it in. Um, by the way, I'd like to point out that between uh, 98 and 11, essentially nothing happened. 03 is something I never say because uh, it is really hard to pin down anything that was done except for clarifying some text. Uh, 
So we are really talking about 13 years. And since we were aiming at 08 or thereabouts, we slipped four years while people saying, oh, we must delay for a year while we get this feature in. Yes, it's difficult to ship on time. Yes, um, people scramble to get things in. Yes, not enough features go in, if after my opinion, in, in some cases. But we are doing much, much better. We are shipping every three years instead of slipping four. Can we? OK, let's make this the last one. Uh, let, let me just add to that, because I, I was one of the people who pushed hard for that. And the committee graciously let me convince them to do it. And, and I wasn't the only one who spoke in favor of it. But it, it, it took a lot to reorganize that way. TSs, absolutely. We, we could use them better. Everybody uses feature branches. Nobody, everybody understands feature branches are good. Yeah, some people say, I ah, shouldn't have used that feature branch for this thing. It should have gone straight into trunk. That's the discussion we're having about. And the TS is a feature branch. The IS is trunk. And it's exactly the same thing. Um, there, so there's, there's no argument that it's good. It's just you learn how to use it best. It's a tool. The biggest improvement about shipping every three years People who weren't living in the, 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 the decade of the 2000s in C++ land, or who were but have moved on, may have forgotten that a lot of people wondered if we were ever going to ship another stand. Yes. That is one of the big reasons why people were surprised that C++11 came out. C++ changes? I thought it was just what it is. It's also why compiler vendors were slow to implement things because they didn't know if they were going to change yet again. Our value references, anyone, changed three times before we finally shipped it. So the fact that we're shipping regularly is one of the reasons why people know what to expect. It's predictable. If you say when, you can't say what exactly will be in each bucket, but you know it's going to ship again. And it should release pressure as people get more used to it, as Olivier said, that, OK, if I don't make this train, there's the next one's about to load. We should learn culturally that that's an OK thing. But the predictability, uh, look, at, look at the world today. We have today, all major compilers are conforming to C++17 within a year of the standard shipping. That has never happened before. And it's because we're shipping predictably and the world can rely on us. And so we really need to keep doing that part of it. I I have an anecdote that, 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 that speaks directly to this. I was the author of a proposal for C++14. Um, it was, I thought it was a significant proposal. I still think it's a significant proposal. It's the searcher's proposal, the Boyer Moore stuff, that the advanced, the extended STD search. Okay, it was in the Library of Fundamentals TS. We, we were going to put it into C++14. It was being discussed, and the wording was being discussed at the very last minute, um, because because the train was leaving, and now or never. And we found some problems in the wording. And there was something that I, I knew how it worked, but I couldn't describe it. I couldn't describe it to everybody's satisfaction. And so I went away and you know walked around the block in Bristol a few times, and then came back and said, OK, take it off the table, because we can't get the wording right. And I realized that, that there, was, there was a chunk of, of technical explanation there that I didn't understand. And I had to go away and think about it. And I realized later that there, there was something wrong with the proposal. And I had to change it. And I came back the next meeting with an updated paper. And it sailed right into C++17. With, it was a better result. I mean, three years later, right? But it was the right proposal. It was the right it was the right design, as opposed to this thing that was kind of hand wavy and wasn't quite really I knew what I meant, but nobody else did. And so. It's not good for a standard. It's not good for a standard. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank Let's you. get the next question. Hello. Uh, one of my big takeaways from this morning talk was that auto could be considered like the weakest form of concept, and that maybe in the foreseeable future, it could be seen as uh, something like from the legacy past, or even like a cold smell that we would need to replace with stricter concepts. And I'm wondering, like, are we seeing uh, some kind of dial back from the almost always auto we preached in the past years? Uh, because uh, I'm still upgrading sometimes code lines to C++11, and I'm still getting like some defensiveness from people who just 
come from C++ so free and are kind of worried about auto. So I'm worried like, is that gonna give them like more arguments against it? I, I will say something because in the first day of this conference, half the people who've stopped me have a question about almost always auto. <laughs> <laughs> and I partly am responsible for coining that. Let me say here on camera, so and, and hopefully clear this up, I, I, what I said at CppCon number one four years ago, but it, it, I understand that the auto type deduction thing obscures this. When I say almost always auto, the number one benefit from that, there are many benefits, but the number one benefit is you cannot forget to initialize. You simply cannot write auto x semicolon. It doesn't compile. You must say equals something. You cannot fail to initialize, and that includes if it's an int, if it's a double, if it's a vector, whatever. When you see that, the almost always auto, a lot of people say, oh, auto, because you want to deduce the type and obscure the type. No, because there are two forms. Auto x equals expression, where it sure deduce the type if you want to track it, but there's also auto x equals type, paren, paren, and then the expression in it. So you put the type on the right. So the point of almost always auto, which by the way, with guaranteed move elision in C17, now there are no cases where you cannot write auto, so it's actually now always auto. <laughs> Double A batteries are bigger than AAA, uh, so this is an upgrade. The purpose is not always to deduce, as if you never needed to know the type you're talking about. The purpose is simply syntactic, because auto is the thing you put at the front. If you declare your variables that way, you can still put the type, it just goes on the right, but you can't forget to initialize and you get a bunch of other uh, benefits. <laughs> and totally separate, if you use auto, you can get confused about what type it is because the information is not there. That has been observed in the wild. And concepts uh, addresses exactly that point and not the others uh, because, again, you must initialize something where you just specify a concept. It just gives you the readability back. And it gives you the constraint. I want an input channel. I don't want any old stuff that comes out of it. Thank you. It complements. Thank you. So, so I think we're actually we in violent agreement be, be, because today, with almost always auto, even without concepts, you can say a concrete type. What, what the concepts let you do is to say, I want any type that satisfies this. Both are declaring a type-like constraint, not just deducing anything, so, and, and that's the key point. Um, it's just in, in many, many cases, you, you don't want to pin down the final type. You don't know it, especially when it's a call to a function that might be a generic function. Or, uh, so, so you pin it down too tightly if you mention the exact type. So let's let Vilo make the last comment and then we'll move right. on. I do have a proposal that allows using auto as a parameter type. So that will potentially extend the realm of auto cases that you might be concerned about. However, the convenience and the, cap the ability of being able, so being able to do that, at least for me, trumps the concerns about potential misuses because it happens to be very useful to be able to write functions like that. Thank you. So the takeaway would be that until we get better concepts, auto is still the way to go. I, we, we have concepts. They're coming. <laughs> they are in the working paper. And uh, the case of Ville, uh, so auto, I mean, I also one that proposed F of auto in 2003. Uh, so it's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. but uh, it can be even better when you use concepts because then you get anything that matches your expectation. Thank you. Hello. Um, if you have a magic wand that, uh, and you gave yourself some latitude to have fun that allowed you to remove something from the standard, what would you remove? The time machine question. I think I'll refuse today. <laughs> <laughs> Macros. And the way you do it is by finishing the process that we've already started of 
having replacements for the important uses. CTAD, uh, constructor template argument deduction. Oh. It's not great. It's not great. Like every snippet of code that I've ever seen, save for one, I have been like, ooh, I would not be happy with that in a code review. That is a feature that came in at the end of the cycle because we were rushing and I'm really sad. Mm. So since you asked a loaded question, I wouldn't actually want to remove the facility. I would just like to rephrase how it's done and that feature is volatile. <laughs> oh, pa yes. Papers welcome. <laughs> I would really like to make it a not be a CV qualifier as such so that it wouldn't uh, mess with what is a copy constructor and what is not a copy constructor. Sounds like a great paper. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got one for free just now. Um, the the dirty basement of SG1, you know, is full of signal handlers and thread local storage and volatile. And honestly, one one thing. Oh, damn. Memory to consume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> no, it's not as bad as the other things. Okay. <laughs> so, right. so CTAD. CTED, I think C, uh, is. Would you like to explain to No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> template argument deduction and deduction guides. My, my real objection to those is the same as Titus. It came very, very late. We didn't understand all the implications. We're still sorting them out. Um, if it had showed up in 2015 instead of 2017, actually, if it showed up in 2014 instead of 2016, I think we'd, we'd be in a much better place right now. Um, <laughs> but, but you wanted you wanted you wanted a short, snappy answer. All right, pair. I want to have fun. Pear. All right. Okay. Okay. This is it. This is it. I, I should one. I should point out for correctness' sake that CTAD was a proposal aiming for C plus plus fourteen, so no, no, no. it did appear at the time. No, we're moving on. Sorry, we're moving sorry. on. The we're proposals to on. add it to the standard library showed up in the last meeting for C17. And I'd like to point out that a fair number of those uh, deduction guides become redundant when we've got concepts. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, next, next question, please. Thank you. So, and it was ready. Okay. So, after the time machine question, uh, I, I was, so clearly C would have been a different language if you all had the experience uh, uh, at the time it was started. So I was wondering, did the committee ever discuss the possibility of forking the language in an ABI compatible way to, uh, that because adding new features like 90% of the work, like Bjorn said, is to integrating with the rest of the language. Having less legacy would help a bit, so that's why I was wondering. There was a stood two, briefly. It's not at a language level fork, but at a library level, like there was a solid discussion of, no. There was a little bit of a discussion <laughs> along those lines. Uh, it's never worth it to invent a new one. Like, I, it, is, it is always a seductive sort of like siren of, oh yeah, you can just ignore all of your legacy. Just, just rev your version number, you'll be fine. Uh, it is a terrible idea. Like, so I don't believe the committee has ever discussed anything like forking language, and boy should we not. So we have occasionally discussed that. <laughs> Not actually in the form of an actual proposal because the idea gets shut down fairly quickly. Stability and backwards compatibility are major features of this language. And there are huge numbers of industry users that rely on those things. We cannot just uh, 
sort of casually think that, oh, hey, let's go all modern and sexy and break every user that we have. Okay, that, this has been it. We're now at under 30 minutes and I'm gonna be much more heavy handed. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, const expert. Uh, because if you write a const expert function, you cannot be entirely certain that this function will be executed at compile time. And now there is this new uh, proposal I, I saw with const expert bang. Um, but I um, discovered, or I'm, I, I mean the impression that I discovered something, that if you return uh, a type that only makes sense at compile time, say std integer sequence from this const expert function, that that then enforces uh, compile time execution. Is that indeed true, or is that something that I just observed in a couple of cases where I, I was lucky to to observe the right thing, and then in a in a black swan case, it it still uh, executes at at runtime. I don't actually know the answer to your question, but I'll point out that the model is that you can do things at compile time uh, by saying const expert you reduce the complexity of the function to the point that if you give it uh, constant arguments, it can be calculated, and you make sure that the compiler keeps the source around so that it can do it. Uh, without that, the compiler's uh, memory space could explode, and also you could get functions where you would be very surprised because the compile time evaluation would be strange. You can force compile time uh, evaluation by assigning to a const expert uh, variable or to a, uh, or use it in a const expert uh, context. Um, that's the model that was, it was never meant to guarantee um, in all cases. Now we are working exactly on that. There are proposals that has been approved in the evolution group to force uh, constant expression evaluation and we'll see how that works out. So the situation you describe, uh, returning a type that supposedly only ever makes sense at compile time, well, that's not accurate. It makes little sense at runtime, but using such a type as the return type doesn't guarantee const expert evaluation. You will get runtime code. Whether that makes sense is a different question. Thanks. So you mentioned that the committee groups have already been um, here for several days discussing things. Is there anything you're able or willing to, to say that they've managed to achieve? <laughs> or, or, or what they've been doing? Let's see, I think I can uh, summarize for the module discussion. Uh, we settled a lot of issues that look somewhat minor and very obscure so that I can't really explain what they really have to do with but it has to do with how do you do in include files and preambles and uh, what are the exact lookup rules in obscure cases. There will be a paper co-signed by the four people that are implementing modules just now for resolving all of those issues to be available in San Diego. So that, uh, gets, that's, uh, okay. Yeah, he was there too, so he can add to it. So, uh, we made very good progress on a couple significant pain points, uh, which are name lookup in templates uh, exported from modules, and the uh, ability to be able to export incomplete types from a module without having to split your code across multiple files. Uh, these were fairly significant pain points, and uh, I'm not going to give you any hard promises, but there's going to be a concentrated effort to put modules into C20. Thank you. Any next question? Wait, there oh, was another okay. two day meeting. Oh, we, that was modules. Okay, let's talk about Okay, sorry. Yeah. Right, so that was Thursday and Friday. Um, Saturday and Sunday was SG1. We were there to talk about executors. Executors are sort of an analogy to allocators for execution. Um, and they're, they're a cornerstone for almost everything we want to do from here on out in the concurrency and parallelism study group. So they're a foundational technology that everything else has expressed a dependency on. 
So we're we're more or less uh, dead in the water uh, until that uh, comes to fruition. We we were driving to maybe hit 20 or barely miss 20 with executors right up until the last meeting. And then we had a surprise major change proposal appear, uh, which forced us to have this extra two-day meeting to sort of metabolize that. Um, and I think, I think we made fantastic progress in the sense that our long-term direction has now, I think, dramatically increased in quality and clarity, but it is now too big to make it for 20. Uh, or there's too much new work that needs to be done to hit 20. But because of that, that actually created a lot of interest in a very narrow compromise that we could ship a very small subset of what we now understand more clearly is the bigger picture and ship that very small subset in 20. So that is still a long shot. Um, I think we're going to try and get the paper in in two weeks. It, it's very tight. The rest of the pipeline, SG-1 is very far away from the draft. Um, from SG-1, we need to forward to LEWG. That needs to get forward to LWG, and then that can be voted on. If we move one room per meeting, we're going to run out of meetings, basically. You have my room, and my axe, and my bow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. I, I think uh, it was great progress, and it looks good. So in recent years, we got LLVM, and LLVM allowed us to write nice little tools to do stuff on our C++ code bases, and that is great. And I've heard Gabriel talking about standardizing something which basically is an AST for, for C++ to represent programs, and we can do transformation passes uh, over them and use that. Uh, what's your opinion or your idea on having a reference implementation of maybe the compiler front end and the standard library so we could have one true thing to look at, which is correct at all times. So, um, so you're volunteering to write it, right? So that uh, there is, there is, I've got half of a front. There end. is a lot of obvious value in that, and even more non-obvious work. And it yes, has it's been, a lot it, of work. And that has been proposed for almost thirty years. <laughs> um, it is virtually never going to happen. The reason is, is because, first of all, you'd have to bless an implementation, keep it in sync with the standard, and you might have noticed we're, we're, we struggle to ship the standard yes. in the same way. Um, so there's just no, no bandwidth. The closest to that is, uh, is basically compiler test suites that companies like Plum Hall and Perennial make, and the, the bug lists and issues list of various compilers as they compare with each other. All right. So you said a implementation that's always correct. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have bad news for you. Yeah. <laughs> Contrary to the popular belief, Smithy isn't perfect. His implementation has bugs. So does the one that I work on. So I think that's a slight oxymoron right, yes. to have an implementation that's always correct. It's beneficial that we have multiple implementations and uh, multiple uh, different people uh, reading the spec and implementing it and then providing feedback on whether it's crystal clear or not. It's uh, a pain in the neck not being a monoculture because there's so yeah. much that has to be done. But it's hugely important for the long-term life of C++. One of the um, one of the the things that gets the uh, the core and the LWG um, groups really interested in a problem is when you, somebody says we have implementation divergence, which means that different groups of implementers, whether it be compiler implementers or library implementers, have read the same words and come away with different meanings. No, I've been there. I've implemented this. Than a library and I've, right. I've, I've come to different conclusions to the wording. Mm -hmm. That means that the, the words in the standard are not clear. There's no, a bug exactly. there. Either that or somebody is just smoking crack. <laughs> let, let, let me give one quick analogy. Or maybe and is the right word there. <laughs> you know how, you may have heard how in some high integrity systems, say space vehicles, that 
you don't have just one processor. Yes. You have multiple processors and they vote. Yes. That gives you a much more reliable system than even one perfected processor, and that is the C++ implementation landscape today. Correct. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I wanted to say that. All right. I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I really think that the best thing about C++ is that it's not a monoculture. Because otherwise, we would have the situation where we would say, not about works as coded. <laughs> so the two features that excite me the most would be modules and the meta classes. I would like to hear about two features of yours, one that's almost coming and one that I probably haven't heard about that excites you the most? Question to everyone. Of the features that are currently in the pipeline, actually my two favorites are, are one that's already been accepted for C++20 contracts and one that's getting close to the standard, which is modules. Mm -hmm. Those are two of the, my favorites of the ones that are actively in flight in the core groups right now. Quickly. So, what modules and concepts. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Concepts, as opposed to making uh, generic programming palatable, they make generic programming possible. <laughs> so, it's something that I can't wait to have. Uh, reflection eventually is going to be a real game changer. Okay. The parts of the standard library that throw exceptions are not usable in contexts where allocating memory isn't, accept, isn't acceptable. Um, do static exceptions offer hope for this use case of the standard library? Um, that's my proposal. It has not come to evolution yet. It's very early days. We hope to solve those kinds of problems, but it's very early. It's, um, it's mostly been incubating in study group 14. Thank you. So we may talk about that kind of thing more tomorrow or Wednesday. So do you have any examples of feature which you want to see in C++ but which uh, cannot be implemented because of some compiler developers say, sorry, we cannot implement it yet? I, I work with a compiler that it does not yet implement concepts. <laughs> but they can, uh, but uh, it can be implemented. They can implement it, and I, I believe it will be implemented soon, but not yet. Maybe I have misunderstood your question. Then. I mean, fundamentally, everything in uh, everything in the standard that's listed as uh, uh, no diagnostic required is an indication of this is definitely a problem, but it would require us to solve a really, really hard programming problem, maybe the halting problem, to actually force it to be a compilation error. So effectively, like a significant part of the undefined behavior landscape, like everything ODR related, is the answer to your problem, the answer to your question, right? Like, if we had infinite magic for the compiler, we would stop having ODR problems. And that would be actually way, way more important when than most modules, other things. When we get modules, we'll have real ODR. When we get modules and rewrite all of the legacy code in the world. Good. <laughs> uh, I'll tell a story. This is important. Uh, I explained what it would take to use modules really well to some senior engineers. And they said, great, we'll have to rewrite all of this code that our managers wouldn't allow us to rewrite. <laughs> we can finally clean up our messes. I was shocked. Then I went to somewhere else, told the same story, got the same result. I've done it three times with people that apparently hadn't talked to each other. This is an opportunity. <laughs> so, right. if you um, 
Yeah. <clears throat> Titus's comment, actually, that, that the phrase that strikes dread into, into my heart all the time is IFNDR, ill form, no diagnostic required. You know, your program will compile, it's broken a priori. Okay, if that, it's like, and we're not going to tell you. It's, it's a terrible place to be. But we're working on it. <laughs> it's not undefined behavior, but it's like undefined behavior. Okay, thank you. Hi, it's me again. Um, no one else was in line. So uh, I've asked this every year that I've been at the Gorilla Committee. And um, so about the restrict qualifier. <laughs> Where is it? How's it doing? Who's working on it? Like, is it coming? Is it dead? Which paper? Because I've, <laughs> I've got 33 that I'm working on, and I can only bring 12 to San Diego. Do you have a paper on restriction? No. Are you just asking for someone to do your work for you? In this case, yes. But also, someone yeah. was working at one point because Herb said, someone is working on this. Oh. Cookie licking is bad form. Like, just because someone else is working on it doesn't mean you shouldn't be, too. I wasn't allowed to work on papers until this year. Uh, no alias must go. This is non-negotiable. Uh, one more time, sorry. That was a quote from Dennis Ritchie about the first version of Restrict. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it cannot be defined well. It can, uh, can be used well in particular areas, in particular context. And the committee has looked at this a couple of times and each come to the conclusion that people wanted it already had it. So there's always the option of prodding the authors of that proposal and asking them how it's doing. I don't know who is writing that. Herb just said that someone was writing that. I, I, I don't want to burn innocent people in a public forum like this. Just look at the previous proposals on this subject matter and contact the authors. But that would require me to read things. <laughs> and, and I don't know of any active one this year. Okay. And super pro tip, uh, wg21.link slash indexed.txt gives you a searchable text file of all of the paper numbers and titles. But then I would have so to you read can, things. Right? <laughs> right? So you can find on page for restrict. And it breaks Google all the site time, search. Though. Oh. Site. <laughs> That's what I used. I mean, uh, the, yeah, the, the link he said. Um, but just site colon, any good any good search engine site colon open s stdorg space restrict. You so can you're even go just to the wg twenty one committee, to... and then that, that will search the the paper bodies as well. <laughs> that sounds like a better option. Okay. <laughs> He's telling me to use Bing. I'll Bing it. Okay. Uh, hi. So uh, I read Fiona's paper, Remember the Vasa. Uh, so the paper has a list of papers, but I don't see much data like proving those papers don't work well together. And I also hear people have different interpretation on what does this pa paper mean. So can you or the direction group tells me that what kind of message you want to convey through that paper. Um, that paper actually had a conclusion section. And I have noticed a lot of people commenting on that paper without reading it at all. Um, and so there was a, a lot of um, hostile comments and a lot of wild cheering from C++ haters uh, about it. Uh, but my point is that you cannot have everything. And I looked at the mailing before I wrote it. There was 43 papers that, in my opinion, would change the way we wrote code. Uh, we could not handle that much in any reasonable time. And if the, we, as a committee, did it, the community could not absorb those lessons and use the facilities well the language would become unmanageable and unteachable if we accepted all of those 43 papers. I was quite clear that three of them I would support. But the point is we have to make decisions, we have to decide what we do, 
and my recommendation was to work really hard on proposals that would be foundational uh, and actually improve the language as used and as used in the future. That was my main uh, reason. I fear the number of minor features that are undoubted conveniences for somebody somewhere, but each of them has a cost uh, in, in teaching and understanding and there are too many, in my opinion, small conveniences that uh, doesn't bring the world forward. Um, and I don't doubt that some of those small uh, uh, improvements are significant. Ortho, Ortho was a really good improvement for each, uh, I mean, uh, range four was a really good proposal. So it doesn't have to be big and massive, but we have to look at what will bring the community as a whole forward as opposed to what can be done. There's so many things that can be done that in the end would, would sink our ship. Thank you. So, I, we've cleared the questions. Anyone has a question? There's not much time left, but we could probably get another question, but I've got one for you, and I, I had something that was referred to earlier. The size of the committee has grown pretty dramatically. Is the size too large? Is it too big? I will say that I chair one of this pretty much the smallest group. My group is not too big. <laughs> I would be happy to have a few more people in my group. I have a very simple answer to you, no. And my answer is the opposite. Of course the committee is too big. You can't uh, really um, get agreement among 150 people easily. On the other hand, there's absolutely no way of reducing that committee. It is a result of enthusiasm, and no, um, no manager could pick the uh, subset of that that would be more efficient in getting things done. So this is just the way we are, and we should be happy about it. So I am actually not that concerned about the increased difficulty of having agreement in the committee because I think that uh, the more eyes we put on possible bugs, the better end result we'll get. Agreed, but we also get many, many more proposals because most people who come to the committee want to at least have one feature added to the language. I, I was gonna say something similar. I think we could, a lot of people could join, that's not a problem, and, and the quality increases dramatically, I think, with participation. But the workload also increases with participation, and our pipeline, the, our pipeline's structure has stayed the same over a doubling of the workload. And so with the same, I hate to be very hardware-y, but with the same pipeline depth, we can't clock as fast. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so, so some someday we'll probably have to restructure the execution graph of of the of the committee if uh, if if we keep growing. But uh, this shouldn't slow people down. Pe more people should come. I'll just point out that to a hardware guy, everything's a hardware problem. <laughs> to us software people, this is. I would also encourage, yes, more people should come, but more people should come without an agenda and having read d and &E and having understood what C++ is for because we fail at that and I failed at that when I first was part of the committee. Um, like C++ is here to be the language where there is nothing, no room for something more efficient between us and the hardware. C++ is the language to be here like, you do not pay for what you do not use, right? C++ is not the language for you cannot possibly misuse it. Um, <laughs> and so, especially like coming to the committee, like from a perspective of like, I run the Google style guide. Like, I started trying to prevent all possible misuses and that was the wrong choice. Like, that's not C++, we need defense in depth. Like, the language needs to enable all of those things for efficiency, and then you need style guides and linters and best practices and senior engineers to tell you, no, dummy, don't do that. <laughs> and that's fine. That's actually working as intended. More people, less paper, 
And, and, and don't forget the abstraction mechanisms that allows you to get away from some of that uh, messiness in a way that suits your needs, not the machines, All right. not mine. We've got another question. Let's go ahead. So core weight is there because we're afraid of using good keywords. Is this really the lesser evil? <laughs> what color did you say? He said Koa weight. Um, I have, I think, said in public that Koa weight is really close to a like, oh, 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 I hate this so much. Um, unfortunately, it comes as a triad of co await, co return, and co yield. And doesn't make it better. Does not make it better in any way. But I seriously spent uh, a solid week this summer trying to come up with a triad of options that actually fit together and that we hadn't already uh, squatted on any of those names. And if you have a solution to this problem, I would love to talk to you. Like, because I hate co await with the passion of 10,000 sons, but I don't have a better option. We need keywords, and all the good ones has already been taken. So we get const expo, we get deco type, we get co await, which I happen not to hate. Um, Can we take them away? Sorry? The keywords. I know it's a hard problem to take keywords away from, from people that are use, already using them. The standard library uses them. So we consider trying to take yield. It's impossible without breaking half of the world. So naming is hard. Grabbing keywords is hard. Sometimes we need to make imperfect compromises. Get over it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're going to get a better answer, and we're almost out of time here. So I want to thank you guys all for uh, being here, sharing your thoughts, maybe giving us some insight into the process, and maybe some insight into the future. I want to thank you guys for great questions. and. Um, uh, we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow for another day of CPPCon. So thank you very much. <laughs>